Hi everybody. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, so I was trying to think about what I wanted to do for my next video, my next book related video. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, one of my reading goals that I have for this year uh, that I've mentioned a few times in passing in different videos, but I haven't actually expanded on. The project is um, a First Nations reading project for me. And I was endeavoring to read at least one First Nations of Canada book per month. And so far I have met my goal with that. Uh, as I'm recording this, it is the beginning of May. And the reason that I wanted to do this is because there's, there's several reasons, but the main reason is because I think the settler cultures in Canada, so settler is referring to people who have come to, have immigrated to Canada, who are not from the indigenous culture that was here originally when European settlers arrived. So that would, that I qualify in that category. My family qualifies in that category. Um, we, the, the traditional education system of Canada in general, which is actually controlled by each province, they control the style of education that is given out, um, to children from elementary school through high school. That education was very lacking in terms of First Nation content when I was growing up. My formative um, years were in the 80s and 90s, and there were several um, conflicts that occurred in the part of the country that I grew up in uh, between First Nations people and uh, police and military and the government. Um, and I never felt that I knew the whole story behind those things, and a lot of First Nations history and the truth about um, different scenarios that existed in these two cultures clashing against each other was not not part of our education system. I feel I was taught about First Nations culture in a way that made it seem like the culture was dead, but not like what is happening today, who are First Nations people now, what what systems am I participating in that are creating or perpetuating the oppression of First Nations people in Canada? So that was not part of my education. I now live in a different province where they have redone the curriculum for my children. So my two school-aged children who are in grade five and grade two are learning about First Nations in a very different, more integrated way. And I'm very happy about that. But I still feel a lack in terms of understanding where First Nations rights are, how um, I can be an ally towards fixing those things. And also what I can do and how I can understand better to help and to just be a good person and in in especially because social justice is very important to me and I see the inequalities and the inequities that are rampant in our society and they are very distressing to me. Um, and I know that I benefit from being a white settler person in Canada. I know that that is a privilege that, that I have and that I benefit from every day. So what I'm doing is reading these books to educate myself. Um, this is also partly a, a deeper um, research project for me in terms of um, my artwork as well, because there's a large body of work that I am developing, that I've been developing for at least five years now, maybe more, um, that I have not even started making. But I am gathering knowledge for, gathering ideas for, um, laying the groundwork for this work to happen in the coming years. And so reading these books and learning about the true 
history of the way that not only the way First Nations people were treated during colonization, but also what the systems of colonization are doing to them today, like right now, um, is very important. The Reconciliation Manifesto, Recovering the Land, Rebuilding the Economy by Arthur Manuel. This is a nonfiction book. This talks about um, the legal implications, the political implications, the internal um, structures that have been set up on First Nations reserves and First Nations communities in order to um, try to govern them, their world and create a, a prosperous world and how the whole way that the government of Canada is set up is is not allowing First Nations people to truly be independent and to truly um, live with self-determination. Um, so that is the nonfiction I'm reading this month. And then I'm also reading Monkey Beach by Eden Robinson. This book was actually um, voted uh, for the Canada pick for the Read Around the World book club that Mel's Bookland Adventures does. Um, I would really encourage you to join that book club. It's a wonderful um, book club with a lot of great picks. I am already 130 pages in and I'm in the first section. So I think I will give you a little uh, rundown of this when I'm finished the first section and talk a bit more about it. Hi everybody. So I wanted to give you my thoughts on the first section of Monkey Beach, which I finished a few days ago. I've actually read past that now. The first section is called Love Like the Ocean. Um, it's divided into four sections. And in terms of structure, there isn't really chapters um, in this uh, novel. Instead, um, they're arranged in kind of vignettes and they have little dividers. Uh, when the section is, I know there's a technical term for those, <laughs> and I don't remember what they are. Right, so you'll find, you'll, you'll, asterisks? I don't know what it is. Anyway, there's those dividers for sections. Um, so even though there's not chapter breaks, at least there's a, there's a good place to stop reading if you need to stop reading. So, <clears throat> the first section is really just setting up um, where we are, so where the location is of Kitimat, how the town is set up uh, on the coast. She even goes, she goes into quite specific detail about where, how to get to Kitimat along the north coast of British Columbia, because um, a lot of those towns and areas in British Columbia are very isolated. There's not an easy road route to get to many of these places, so there are, a lot of them are accessed more by water, by plane, etc. Uh, so you meet Lisa Marie, and um, she starts kind of explaining her life, um, her family, and the structure of her family, and you you move from present to past. So in the present, she is in her late teens, and um, her brother has gone missing on a, in a fishing boat. His fishing boat just has not been found. It's, it's, it's missing at sea. And um, so you start in this in the midst of this crisis happening in the family, and her parents are obviously worried, and they decide to fly to the nearest town where the, the boat was last sighted so that they can aid in the search for her brother. And so what you're seeing through Lisa Marie's eyes is her emotional upheaval at this horrible thing, at her brother being missing. Um, and then you're also led into kind of her internal life where you can tell she has um, a very spiritual and kind of superstitious world that she um, has inside her head, but that is also connected to her culture, her Heisla culture. And then you also learn about the past of her family. So you learn about their childhood, you learn about the different members of their family. It's a large family, there's lots of aunts and cousins. Um, and you find out how it was for them growing up. So I think the um, Love Like the Ocean is just really a, it's a lovely description of 
the family situation. Uh, you can tell there's a lot of love in their family, but there's also a lot of drama. I think that's pretty typical of many families. And um, you also under start to hear about the, the rhythm of their life. And the rhythm of their life has a lot of connection to specific um, gathering and hunting rituals that are part of, and fishing rituals that are part of the Heisla culture that they come from. So when they go and collect this certain type of fish, which they make this certain type of grease from that they use to, um, to uh, flavor some of their foods and preserve foods. And you, you learn a lot about the food culture um, and their, just their general culture that surrounds their, um, their nation. So uh, really, really liked it. I think it was interesting because there's a lot of Canadian um, growing up in the late 70s um, commercial aspects to it. Like a lot of, there's a bit of nostalgia in there for I think people who uh, who grew up in our culture, like references to certain foods like Jello and um, and Twinkies and just things like that that are very North American centered. And the voice is really interesting because Lisa Marie speaks in a very um, Canadian dialect, um, but also mixing in the Heisler language words. So that's, I find, really fascinating as well. And I also really enjoyed, in the first part, um, the way that the spirituality and the superstition of the culture is worked into the story overwhelming or distracting from the realness of the people and there's also these really lovely little passages <clears throat> which are very descriptive of the of nature and they're a little bit mystical i feel like they are potentially there to kind of um give you some sort of a underlying connection to part of the plot that is not yet to be revealed. So I feel like their presence in the story might be right be shown and and you'll understand a bit more about why they're here later on in the story. So I'll just read you a really quick part and to tell you what I mean. So we're we're going through the narrative here and Lisa Marie is living her life and doing different things and then there's this this small little section here on page 82. At Kimano, there is a graveyard. Leave our house with its large black-eyed windows staring out at the channel. Follow the path down to the beach. Follow the beach to the point. About a three-minute walk, enter the trees, step over the fallen logs, and watch out for the prickly waist-high devil's club. All graveyards should have moss-covered trees creaking in the wind and the sound of the waves grating the round stones on the beach. The trees are so high and large here that under this canopy, even the brightest day is pale. Wander slowly, careful where you step. No neat rows of crosses, no meticulous lawn, no carefully tended flowers will guide you. Too sterile, antiseptic. Headstones carved into eagles, blackfish, ravens, beavers appear seemingly at random. In the time of the great dying, whole families were buried in one plot. Pick wild blueberries when you're hungry. Let the tart taste sink into your tongue followed by that sharp sweetness that store-bought berries lack. Realize that the plumpest berries are over the graves. So it's kind of just this beautiful little um, prose poem almost that's inserted in here. And <clears throat> I really like those little vignettes because they really enhance the atmosphere of the story and give you a sense of the history of the place. That was the first section. I really enjoyed it. And... Um, I am getting really close actually to the end of the second section now, so I'll check back in once I finish that and give you some more thoughts. Hi everyone, I thought I would check in. It is Thursday, May 8th. And um, I'm still not done the second section of Monkey Beach, but I'm getting really close, so I'll probably be able to check in and talk about that soon. 
I just wanted to say that um, this weekend coming is Mother's Day weekend. And there's a Mother's Day a thon happening. Well, sorry, it's not called Mother's Day a thon, it's called 100 a day. Um, sorry, I'll just look up what it's actually called so I can actually tell you accurate information. So it's a hundred day hashtag, a hundred a day reading challenge, which is hosted by um, two different bookstagrammers at Divi Divi 85 and a good East egg. Um, and I just saw it, I think this morning, or maybe it was yesterday and thought, can I actually get read a hundred pages a day? And the whole idea of this readathon is to do it because you're a mom and you deserve to do the thing that you love on the day that's supposed to be for you, which is really nice and a, a wonderful idea. Um, the thing about my job, my day job, so not my being an artist job, but my other job, um, is that on Saturdays, the Saturday before Mother's Day, we host a Mother's Day tea. And so I run that event and that's gonna take up, I'm gonna be working all day on Saturday. And then I work my regular five hour shift tomorrow on Friday. And so the 100 a day is supposed to go for three days. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I think I can get 100 done a day done tomorrow because I don't work the whole day and I usually read quite a bit in the evening. And then Sunday shouldn't be a problem at all because it's Sunday and I don't, have any big plans right now um, but Saturday I don't know if I can fit in a hundred pages but I thought it would be fun to participate and see where it goes and I'll finish up um, the two books I'm reading because I have about 150 pages left I think of this one maybe less 130 pages left of the Reconciliation Manifesto and um, once I finish section two of Monkey Beach I won't have that much left of it because it's not a very long book and the last two sections are much shorter than the first two and I've already put my um, next set of books for May on hold um, I've got three non-fictions that are sorry no they're fiction I think I'm tired. Um, there are three novels. Anyway, that was just a check-in. Um, I was home today. I did not that much reading. More art stuff and um, laundry and appointments and things like that. And uh, I will check in again when I've done the second part of Monkey Beach. So, talk to you later. Hello! It is really hot here today, so I am... I am flushed looking. <laughs> I finished the second section of Monkey Beach by Eden Robinson, and I wanted to just check in and um, talk about it a little bit. I had a perception at the beginning um, that the second section would shift a bit in perspective, but that didn't happen. The structure really stayed the same and the years are coming up in the second part. And, um, I really care about her as a character. And so, um, I don't really want to spoil her what happens, but there's something traumatic that happens in, to her in the second part of this book and I thought that Eden Robinson wrote that in such a to the point but poignant way. There's nothing over dramatic about it. There's nothing foreboding like you just have this moment where you think everything's okay and then in the next moment something horrible is happening and that really threw me I felt I was reading right before bed so it really threw me off and I felt really um 
upset by it. I didn't expect it. But what I love about it is that it does seem like such a realistic portrayal of something like that happening. Um, and her relationship with her Mama Moo, Mama U, sorry, Mama U, which is the name for grandmother in Haisla. I think that's how you say um, the name of the language. Um, the relationship between the two of them is amazing and very enriching and very profound. And um, I think that she hits a lot of nails on the head with how Lisa Marie's character is coming of age and becoming a teenager and how the little things that are quirky about you when you're a kid become can become like mountains to climb when you're a teenager. So I kind of I kind of wanted the story to be a bit more in the present because um I I think I may have read too many coming of age stories in a row. So the perspective of someone, a young person, is just, it's, it's not really repetitive, but it's, it's not holding me. But I do love her character, so I think in terms of a story and, and a, a well-told story, this is certainly that. So, um, I did talk to you yesterday about how I want to, um, do the 100 a day Mother's Day reading challenge <laughs> and I have just under 100 pages left in Monkey Beach so I, I'm i going to try to get some read now. I was just watching booktube and then I realized that I should actually be reading <laughs> if I'm going to get this 100 a day done. So I'm going to work on that one. I'm going to work on the Reconciliation Manifesto, which I also have about 100 pages left. So I will check in again and talk a little bit more about this book um, when I'm finished it, I think. because Or maybe after part uh, part three. We'll see. But the, the last two parts are very short, so I may not want to take a break in between. Um, that's all I got to say about that. So I'll talk to you again later. everybody. So I'm finished with um, the two books that I mentioned at the beginning of this vlog. Um, Monkey Beach by Eden Robinson, which was the Read Around the World book club pick for May. I really enjoyed this. I would say it was very close to a five star read for me. There was just a couple little things to do with the plot that left me a bit confused or not quite as satisfied, but overall, the descriptions of the north, the, the northern coast of British Columbia, what it's like to live on the northern coast, um, the description of the village in which um, Elisa Marie, who's the main character, lived, her family relationships, uh, her experience um, with seeing ghosts and the supernatural elements of her culture. Um, the food descriptions were amazing in here. So First Nations food, their relationship with the land, their relationship with the um, animals that they harvest, the relationship with the, um, the different areas that they would travel to to do to fish certain types of fish or to gather certain types of foods. All those things I thought were really, really special and important things to share. Um, as a settler Canadian, these cultural aspects are not something that is incorporated into my culture because um, our relationship with my relationship with the land as a settler is very different than a First Nations person whose ancestors have lived in this continent for thousands of years. So reading about a living culture, something that is existing today and how um, Lisa Marie's family gathered their food and lived and functioned in society was just a wonderful experience. And um, as a story, I really enjoyed it and I really enjoyed the unknown sensations of it. Um, 
I thought it would be much more of a present day story where it was talking about her journey to try to find her brother. But I don't think in the end that that's really what the story is about. It's more about the internal journeys that we all go through when we're trying to understand who we are as people. So I, I would recommend this. I just finished the Reconciliation Manifesto, Recovering the Land, Rebuilding the Economy by Arthur Emanuel. This is a super important book in terms of understanding where First Nations want to, not necessarily all First Nations together collectively, but I believe, but Arthur Manuel does speak in that manner. He's trying to provide a pathway for First Nations people to achieve agency and achieve justice in the system that is Canada and how we have created a system over the last several hundred years that has that continues to oppress first nations and how we can revert we can acknowledge what we've done collectively and then move forward as equal nations so it's a really important read um i am really glad that i read it and i'm really glad that these books exist where a First Nation perspective is presented for everyone to read together and try to come to a you know a, a mutual place of respect and understanding, um, and to dispel myths as well about what's actually happening out there. So we're reading along with the 100 a day Mother's Day challenge, and um, I think I should be able to get 100 done today. I've already done probably. 60 to 70 pages so I should be able to reach 100 without any problem and I think I will end the vlog here and I will be back again soon with another video thanks so much for watching